spectacular journeys. They've crossed the Atlantic Ocean. They paved the way for astronauts to fly into space. Over a hundred years ago, they had flown higher than Mount Everest to unlock the secrets of the upper atmosphere. The first balloon flights were made in a field near Annonay in France in the summer of 1783. Two hundred years later, the town still honored their most famous citizens, the Montgolfier brothers, with a pageant to reenact some of their achievements. France is proud of its position in history as the birthplace of aviation. Joseph Montgolfier started with small balloons filled with smoke. He was joined by his brother Etienne, and together they tried different combinations of paper and cloth to contain the gas. They believed it was the smoke rather than its heat which held the balloon aloft, and they used damp straw to generate it. A French nobleman, Francois Pilatre de Rosier, joined them as pilot. By November, they were ready with a balloon which could carry two men. The first ascent was made from a royal palace in the Bois de Boulogne. Watched by the King and Queen of France, de Rosier and another nobleman, the Marquis d'Arlande, rose gently into the air. The Marquis left an account of their flight. We rose up on the 21st of November in the year 1783 at six minutes to two in the afternoon. The balloon ascended with majesty. I was surprised at the silence amongst the people, believing them to be amazed and perhaps fearful at this strange spectacle. At this moment, de Rosier cried, you're doing nothing and the balloon is hardly rising. Forgive me, I replied, and placed a sheaf of straw upon the fire. Astonished, I glanced downwards. There is the river, I said to my brave companion. We shall be sinking in it soon, replied de Rosier. Some fire, my dear friend. With my fork, I seized a bundle of straw and threw it in the middle of the flames. An instant later, I felt myself, as it were, being lifted bodily up to heaven. At one point, small fires started in the fabric, which the Marquis extinguished with a wet sponge. As they floated over Paris, de Rosier coolly ignored his companion's pleas that he should bring the balloon down. Twenty-five minutes after takeoff, they landed safely five miles away. The flight was a sensation in Paris and around the world. After centuries of travel, man had successfully taken to the air. While the world still marveled at the flight, another balloon was being prepared. This time it was filled with hydrogen, a light but highly flammable gas. The pilot was Professor Jacques Charles of the Academy of Sciences. His companion was Noel Robert the man who'd found a way to coat silk with rubber to hold the gas. In the space of two weeks, Paris had witnessed two sensational flights. The next great challenge for balloonists was to cross the 22 miles of sea separating France from England. Jean-Pierre Blanchard, a French balloonist, persuaded Dr. John Jeffries, an American living in England, to back him financially. They set out from Dover on a cold day in January 1785. They had to jettison everything, even most of their clothes, to lighten the load. But the winds were favorable and they arrived over France, cold but triumphant, the first men to cross the channel by air. Francois Pilatre de Rosier also attempted the crossing. 
but his balloon caught fire and he was killed. His death marked the end of the first chapter in the story of manned flight. Ballooning took off in Europe and America. Some balloonists flew for fun, others flew for profit. Soldiers took to the air to spy on their enemies. In 1836, an Englishman, Charles Green, flew 380 miles from London across Belgium to Weilburg in what is now West Germany, an epic journey for its time. But balloonists suffered from a major disadvantage. They had no way to steer their craft. They were at the mercy of the winds. They had little idea where each journey would end. On the other hand, balloons were a perfect way to travel straight up. They provided scientists with an ideal way to explore the atmosphere, to find out how temperature, pressure, and humidity varied with altitude. In 1862, an English scientist, James Glacier, teamed up with a balloonist, Henry Coxwell, to fly six miles above the Earth, higher than anyone had flown before. Today, we take oxygen to such heights. They had none. Passing 27,000 feet, Glacier's eyesight began to fail. It was essential that they stop the balloon's rise. Coxwell found that the line which released hydrogen was snagged. Glacier passed out from lack of oxygen while Coxwell struggled into the rigging to free the line. His hands were so cold he had to use his teeth. He managed to release some hydrogen and the balloon started down. Glacier could have died, but both men recovered and went on to become national heroes for their courage in the pursuit of science. When the shadows of war fell over Europe in 1914, the German Navy had long-range airships to keep a lookout for the enemy's fleet. But the temptation to use them as bombers proved too great. Germany paid a high price for its air raids on Britain. Zeppelins were expensive to build. Filled with hydrogen, they were highly vulnerable to attack. The price in men was small by the standards of that war, but it was a fiery, horrible death. Britain's airships were mainly small, non-rigid types. Their main task was to patrol coastal waters as lookouts for the Royal Navy. Launching them was a battle with the elements. Whatever wind there was, I was attempted to lift it, buffet it to one side or the other, and so therefore you had to have pretty strong people hanging on to it. Very often the wind would blow it around so suddenly and so forcefully that people were taken around with it, hanging on to the turret. But finally you got it on the even too. I was on this ground party getting an airship airborne. And to do that you had three people either side of the gondola. And actually there's a bomb mounted on either side too. So we had to be careful of that. The order came to Hero, and I had an ordinary jacket tunic on, and without noticing it, it had caught in the broken fin of the bomb on the port side. And as the airship went up, I went up with it. But luckily, only about 12 feet, and the whole thing tore off naturally, and I fell, and my pride was bruised, I think, more than my body. You could gain height by um, elevated control. You could turn fairly easily with rudder control. Pilots steered with what looked like a helm, and the controls were grotty looking wire going back outside so that a gust of wind could break one easily and uh, break an elevator control, rudder control, with disastrous results. Being so slow moving, if there were enemy aircraft about, heavier than air aircraft, you would be a sitting target for them, obviously. A lot of airships that served where they could meet aircraft did have 
Armament Board, a Vickers or Lewis gun. If the weather was fairly decent and the sea wasn't too rough, you could see into it quite a distance. Even if the submarine was submerged, you could see from the air a lot easier than a ship could see from the surface. The U-boat captains hated to have an airship hovering around above them. And the reason for this was because they could either surface and attack the airship, in which case they knew that he would then drop his bombs, or be in touch with a naval surface ship which would come along and depth charge him. Either that or he had to stay down. So he would try to lose you by moving or getting deeper and deeper. But eventually you have to come up. I have been airborne on a mission when we have dropped both of our bombs and missed the submarine. So he surfaced, manned his machine gun before we could get too far away and have shot at us. If it punctured the envelope, naturally you lost gas. You often had to patch an airship in the air. You carried patching equipment with you. And obviously, the chap was shooting at you from the bottom. The bullet came into the bottom of the airship and you could reach that like a chap wallpapering. You could um, put a patch on. Airships did valuable service for the Navy, gathering information and reporting back to the fleet. But they were large, slow, and vulnerable. By the end of hostilities, they looked obsolete as a weapon of war. After the war, Germany was prevented from building airships for her own use. The Zeppelin Company maintained its expertise by building one for the United States Navy. Once they were freed from restrictions, the company embarked on a massive new civil airship. It was named after Count Ferdinand, the Graf Zeppelin. It was the biggest airship in the world. The Germans took great pride in their achievement and quickly established a world lead in passenger airship travel. Regular services were flown across the Atlantic to New York or to South America in only two or three days. Eventually, the Graf Zeppelin circled the Earth. Each flight was a luxurious adventure. There was a little sort of steps and they ushered you up, and you realized that you were not in the Zeppelin, you were in this gondola which hung down below, and it looked tiny until you got in it. And then you realized it was 55 meters long. And then, as they let us go, you gradually felt a sort of lift, as if you were in a small boat, and you come to the crest of a wave, you know, you feel yourself going up to the top, and then, gradually going down. And we didn't go down, we just went on going up. <laughs> the ground disappears beneath. There's no noise, no vibration. Everything is as quiet as a mouse. The ground just vanishes away. Then, when we reach a certain altitude, I'm signaled from the control gondola. There's a ringing bell, an urgent sound, and a moving indicator. Engines full ahead, 1,420 revolutions. And so the engines are started and run up to the proper speed. Oh, they hummed so beautifully, so smoothly, they could send you straight to sleep. Very smooth, very quiet, very hushed, and superbly efficient. I mean, real German efficiency at its 